This mini lecture is going to be on cataract and glaucoma. And cataracts are the most common cause of vision loss in people over 40 and are the principal causes of blindness. So you will see these cases more than glaucoma, more than macular degeneration, and even more than di diabetic um, neuropathy. So cataracts do impair the vision due to loss of the transparency of the lens, and there's progressive and painless clouding of the natural internal lens of the eye. So it can block light, making it difficult to see, um, and then there's blindness, which can also occur. So the lens inside the eye works much like a camera lens, and it focuses light onto the retina for clear vision and adjust the eye's focus. So it lets us see, see things clearly, both up and close and far away. So some of the causes are that, you know, there's a buildup of protein in the lens and the lens inside the eye works much like a camera lens. It focuses light on the retina for clear vision. It adjusts the eye's focus, letting you see things clearly, both up close and far away. And it's made mostly of water and protein. And the protein is arranged in a precise way that keeps the lens clear and lets the light pass through it. But as we age, some of that protein may clump together and start to cloud a small area of the lens, which then is called the cataract. And over time, it could grow larger and it could cloud more of the lens, making it harder to see. So no one really knows for sure why the eye's lens changes as we age, forming cataracts, but they do think there are some risk factors that are involved with it. There's age-related cataracts, which are obviously from the result of aging. And there are also congenital cataracts, which um, some babies are sometimes born with this as a result of an infection or injury or some type of poor development, as well as um, development which can occur just generally in childhood. The secondary cataracts develop as a result of possible diabetes, um, UV light, radiation, and even from the use of diuretics and corticosteroids. But probably the majority of it is usually related to the diabetes, the radiation, and the UV lights. And then there's the traumatic ones, which are formed after an injury to the eyes. So some of the risk factors that are seen with cataracts, besides advancing age, is that, you know, UV light radiation from sunlight, diabetes, hypertension, cigarette smoking, um, obesity. Um, there could be prolonged use of corticosteroid medications, statin medications previous eye surgeries or eye injuries, sometimes hormone replacement surgery, I mean, horm horm hormone replacement therapy, as well as um, alcohol consumption. And, you know, you're talking heavy. Some of the signs and symptoms that patients will complain of include the foggy vision. They feel like everything is very clouded. There's, it's blurry. There's a lot of... Um, filminess over their eye. They may complain of being night, nearsighted, which will progress. They'll tell you that they're seeing colors differently than they used to. They may see, you know, greens and blues and many different colors. Night problems um, when driving because of the glare of the lights. It's almost like a halo around the lights or else like stars around the lights. They may get glares during the day and also ch sudden changes in their prescriptions. And this has seemed to be what the biggest problem is, is that they will um, complain that, you know, I went for two, three years. I've never had my, my prescription changed. And now all of a sudden their vision has significantly changed. And that's kind of a warning sign that maybe something could be going on. And they also may see um, some double vision. So this is just a picture of um, cataract that you can see. So you can see the filminess and the cloudiness over the eye. And you can see in the right-sided picture where the lens actually gets clouded. And you can see how the, the as the light progresses through, the lens starts to, uh, the, the light starts to decrease. So when you're trying to get a history on these patients, it's really important that 
you ask them about their visual status. So, you know, are you seeing um, lights around, you know, like halos around headlights at night? Are you seeing like stars around those headlights? Are you noticing visible differences in your vision? Are you noticing that you're just, you're seeing double or that you're having so many difficulties seeing now? And is it happening in only one eye? Is it happening in both eyes? Are you a smoker? You know, this is part of getting your review of systems. Are you a smoker? Um, do you use alcohol? Do you, are you, have you been exposed to air pollution? What is the history of any ocular um, injuries that you've had, diseases, any treatments, any surgeries? And then getting their full medical history. So it's really important when you're getting that history of present illness as well as the review of systems. And then during their physical exam, it's always really important to go ahead and get their visual acuity. That's really important with anything that you do in regards to the eye. So that should be your top priority is the visual acuity. And when you're doing visual acuity, you should do it at um, both near and at a distance. The um, when you're using the ophthalmoscope lens, you want to set that lens to zero and stand about 12 inches from the patient, and you should get a bright red reflex seen through the normal eye. So, if a cataract formation is clearly seen, it's going to be in the disruption of the red reflex. The fundus should also be examined for any retinal abnormalities, particularly macular degeneration, which is manifested by some type of hemorrhage or scarring. And this can cause loss of vision symptomatically. So you want to be looking at vision. You want to be looking at pupillary response. You want to be checking the, the fundus, the red reflex, and doing visual fields for confrontation. As far as medical care, you really are not going to get involved in this other than referring out to ophthalmology. And then they're going to be making the decision on what they want to do based on what they see. They may just do some waiting and you know, see how the patient does in a few months, it's possible that they'll go ahead and do cataract surgery by doing an intraocular lens implant. They may do one eye and then one month later do the next eye if they have to do that. So that decision will be made by the ophthalmologist and you um, really don't have to get involved in that. So as we talk about glaucoma, this is, um, it really refers to a group of related eye disorders that all cause damage to the optic nerve that carries information from the eye to the brain. So glaucoma usually has very few or very initial symptoms. In most cases, it's associated with higher than normal pressure inside the eye. So, you know, that could be called ocular hypertension, but it also can occur when the intraocular pressure is normal. So if it's not treated or if it's continues to be uncontrolled, then the first causes will be peripheral vision loss and eventually could lead to blindness. There's a significant amount of people who do get primary open angle glaucoma. About 20, about, you know, approximately 2.2 million people in the United States suffer from this. And as I said, most of them don't really have those symptoms, so they don't even know that they have it. And unfortunately, it's the second leading cause of blindness in the United States. Glaucoma usually, as I said, incurs when the pressure increases, but also it happens when eye fluid isn't currently um, circulating normally in, in the front part of the eye. So this fluid, which is the aqueous humor, flows out of the eye through a mesh-like canal. And if this canal becomes blocked, then fluid builds up and this causes glaucoma. A, um, a direct cause of the blockage really is unknown, but they do know that it is inherited. So with primary open angle glaucoma, the drainage angle formed by the cornea and the iris remains open and those canals in the angle are, get, do get blocked and then the fluid drains out slow. Because the fluid's draining out slow, it begins to back up in the eye. And when that happens, then that pressure gradually increases within the eye. So it's a very, very slow process that occurs, which is... So just to go over um, the risks, everyone is at risk of developing glaucoma. 
African Americans have a higher tendency to develop glaucoma than do um, any other specific uh, ethnicity. Their fam the family history of glaucoma is another important thing, as well as diabetes, the Hispanic race, um, Asians. There, you know, there seems to be a significant amount with people who use steroid users, if they who are steroid users, or if they've had an eye injury in the past. But the biggest um, thing seems to be the ethnicity. That seems to be the, um, the, 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 the most prominent that you'll see. As we talk about the signs and symptoms of primary and open anger and acute open angle glaucoma, uh, with the primary, there's loss of peripheral vision. And then when it starts to get into the advanced stages, there's tunnel vision. But at first, it really there really isn't any symptoms. There, there's no pain. The vision usually stays normal. And so this is a very slow, slow, progressive um, thing. When it starts to remain untreated is when, you know, they start to see that, you know, they may miss objects to the side and out of the corner of their eye. And then they start saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm looking, feels like I'm looking through a tunnel. And over time, the vision may decrease until there really isn't any vision that remains. With acute, there's cupping of the optic disc. And when the cupping is noted, the visual um, field testing should be done to check for any characteristics of field deficit. So confrontation testing um, to look for large def uh, you know, deficits is very important to do and necessary because even subtle ones can make a difference. So with acute, you're going to see blurred vision. They may complain of unilateral headache. They may also complain of photophobia or even they may complain of nausea. And this is just a picture where you can see the increased pressure, how it damages the optic nerve. And this shows you how the light actually goes in and dissipates through. In a healthy eye, you can see the differences in the, the angle that it goes in. And that's why it's called angle glaucoma, uh, open or acute. And this also is another picture to show you the damage to the optic nerve and how this causes that because of the pressure that builds up. And you can see on the right bottom side the buildup of the aqueous humor fluid there, which causes that. So either eye in itself can be producing too much fluid and not be draining properly. And these are just two other pictures um, of glaucoma where you can see the opacity that's occurring. As we look then at getting the history when the patient comes into the office, the important thing to ask them is the onset and duration. You know, how long has this been going on? And do they have difficulty with peripheral vision? Sometimes I let them say to me, this is what's going on with my vision instead of feeding into it, because I want to hear them tell me what they're what they're experiencing versus me saying, are you losing your peripheral vision? Because they may say yes. But if they say to me, you know, I'm not seeing things on the side or out of the corner of my eye anymore, then I know that they're really, truly losing that peripheral vision. Um, asking them about any headaches or light sensitivity, are they getting blurred vision? And then for your review of systems, really honing in on that personal and family history. Once again, you know, with the review of systems going into the eye symptoms and, you know, have you had any eye injuries, eye, eye surgeries or anything related to that? So all of that is really going to be important for you to capture when you do the um, review of systems. When performing the physical exam, looking at the external structures of the exam, uh, the eye is, as well as you know, is there any swelling, ptosis? Is there any injection in the, on the conjunctiva or the sclera? Is there clarity in the cornea? Um, visual acuity of emergency, you know, should not be suspected. And if you do, then it's immediate um, emergency room referral. And looking at direct peripheral vision by using your confrontation. And then measuring intraocular pressure by use of the SCIOTS tonometer. Now, most primary care offices really don't carry that. But um, a tonometer is used to 
measure intraocular pressure. So your eye is typically, you know, numbed with an eye drop and a small probe gently rests against your eye. And then th that tonometer sends a puff of air into your eye surface. Many times now, uh, people are telling me when they go to the ophthalmologist, they have new machines where they don't have that uh, puff of air going into the eye anymore, but some, some offices may. So if you have an abnormally high IOP on the tonometer, it indicates a problem with the amount of, you know, aqueous humor that is in the eye. So it could either be, you know, producing too much fluid or it's not really draining properly. And it should be below 21 millimeters of mercury based on how much force is exerted with, you know, a certain defined area. So if it's higher than 30, then your risk of vision loss from glaucoma is 40 times greater than someone with an IOP of 15 or lower. So this is why, um, you know, when you treat glaucoma, when patients are treated such a, you know, they use eye drops and that those are because they need to keep the intraocular pressure low. What would you think about for differential diagnoses? Well, could they have, you know, some type of a conjunctival pattern going on, you know, conjunctivitis? Could they have something in related to uveitis? Could they have possibly macular degeneration? And macular degeneration is something that's kind of concerning to patients because um, this, is a, this is also something that can cause severe damage to the eyes also. And so if this is suspected, then you need to be working them up further. Thinking about differentiating between, you know, a glaucoma pattern and a macular degeneration pattern, um, when you think of degeneration, that's just what it is. The central visual, visual acuity is the one that's most affected. So they may complain of a loss of visual acuity that is not corrected by eyeglasses. And where, the, where other patients may, you know, think, talk to you about loss of peripheral vision. And there's a wet and a dry macular degeneration. And we're not going to get into all that, but you just need to make sure that you understand the difference between macular and glaucoma. Because there is, you know, one is, one is looking at um, central vision and the other one is looking at peripheral vision. And so th that's how you kind of differentiate between the two. And so glaucoma, obviously, you're not treating in the primary care office. You are going to be referring them out to a specialist, and they're going to make a decision on, on specific treatment that the patient needs. So, you know, they probably will be on drops for the rest of their life. That's usually what does happen is that they need to have eye drops and be, um, um, you know, be evaluated on a yearly basis. Sometimes they're evaluated more frequently there's times when they have mild glaucoma and they're only on one, maybe one eye drop. And then there's times when they have, um, you know, moderate to severe glaucoma and they have to be on two, maybe three eye drops, depending on the severity of the problem. So it's just really going to depend on what the ophthalmologist decides that they want to do. There's different types. There's prostaglandin analogs, which lower intraocular pressure. There's topical uh, beta adrenergic agonists, ant, uh, antagonists, which decrease the production of the aqueous humor. There's alpha-2 selective adrenergic agonists, and um, those also help to decrease the intraocular pressure because they reduce the aqueous humor production. And then there's carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, which also decrease both of those. So it's really going to depend. They may also have laser and surgical intervention, which is possible, but um, that's going to be up to the, the specialist.